Hello and welcome to Serena Speaks and in this video we are going to go through the ABC of OTC. Now as you can imagine there are so many potential situations and scenarios that could be presented to you especially in a community pharmacy setting. So what I've tried to do is go through some of the key um, over-the-counter situations that you might be presented to you, that you might find yourself in, some of the treatment options that are available, and in what situations you would need to refer. So let's begin. So let's start off with A for allergies. And especially with this time of year when it's hay fever season, we're going to be presented with a lot of patients complaining about red, puffy eyes, um, runny noses, blocked noses, just your typical hay fever symptoms. But when we say allergies as well, allergies can also come in the form of allergic dermatitis. So if somebody's maybe touched something, they've then got some kind of rash because of it. And so what do we need to give? Well, first and foremost, an oral antihistamine. Now, remember, all antihistamines have a level of sedation. It's just some vary. So for example, something like loratadine, cetirizine, they are less sedating. Whereas something like chlorphenamine, that's a bit more sedating. Um, in terms of the eyes, so if they're red, if they're puffy, if they're watery, something like the sodium chromoglycate eye drops, that's probably the best bet. And if a patient wants a nasal preparation, then something with anti-inflammatory effects. So, for example, your beclometasone nasal spray can help with allergic rhinitis. A is also for acne. So a patient may decide to go to their GP and get maybe doxycycline and limecycline um, to help with acne, but also over the counter, they could be given acne side. Now acne side, it contains benzoyl peroxide and benzoyl peroxide is very effective with acne, with acne treatment. However, a patient does need to persevere with the treatment, especially within the beginning stages, because it can cause a burning sensation, can be quite reddening, and it can cause peeling of the skin, especially within the first few weeks of treatment. So it's really important to counsel your patients on this, because um, it because they might if they didn't know that, then once they start using it, they might think, oh, this shouldn't be working like this, and then it might put them off continuing with the treatment. So just warn them that this may happen in the beginning stages, but it will get better after that. If the symptoms are um, too much for the patient to take, then it might be worth them discontinuing the treatment for a while and then starting it back up again. Also with benzoyl peroxide, it's important that the patient avoids excessive sun exposure. And if they are going to be out and, out and about in the sunshine, then they should wear a good sun cream. B is for burns. Now the burns that I'm focusing on are those that you might see in the community. So more milder burns, maybe if you scolded yourself whilst cooking or something. So with a burn, it's very important to keep the area. So let's go with the hand, for example, if you burnt the hand, keep the hand under water, cold water for at least 10 to 15 minutes. Um, you can cover the burn with a dressing, a sterile dressing. Usually a gauze and a padded dressing is, is sufficient. With the burn though, don't burst the blisters, even if it seems tempting to, and it's important to keep the area clean. You could also use an antiseptic cream um, on top of it, for example, something like Savlon, and your patient might need some form of pain relief um, if the burn is really hurting them. So maybe paracetamol, if they can take ibuprofen, then maybe ibuprofen too. C is for coughs and colds. Now, let's imagine our patient doesn't take any other regular medication. Um, they don't have any other underlying underlying effects. They've, they've got a cough and cold and they've presented that to you. So if it's a dry cough, we could recommend something like codeine linctus or folcadine linctus. The problems with these, though, is that they are sedating, can be constipating and they have those dependency issues and they most definitely should not be given to somebody or recommended to somebody under 12. We could also give something like dextromethorphan or glycerol or even simple linctus. A patient might benefit from a lozenger, particularly one that contains antiseptic um, and anaesthetic properties such as your tyrosets or they might want a spray such as our benzodiazepine spray which will help numb the area and just help with general pain relief. If it's a chesty cough or they've got mucus coming up, then a, a product containing guafenicin would be of most benefit to them. Now, remember, with cough and cold remedies, they are not recommended to anyone under six years old. I mean, you do have the paediatric simple linctus and the glycerol because they're quite tame, they're fine. But I mean, ones containing such as 
guaifenesin or codeine, they're a no-no. In situations in which we'd need to refer the patient would be if they had any blood coming up, if they had maybe a greeny coloured mucus, because that usually indicates a bacterial infection, whereas the products that we recommend over the counter are usually tailored for viral infections. Also, the person is wheezing, because maybe this um, is a symptom of uncontrolled asthma, or if the patient takes, for example, an ACE inhibitor, so such as ramipril, where we know that dry cough is a predominant side effect in some patients taking ramipril. Patients might also benefit from aromatic inhalations, so those containing menthol and eucalyptus, because they can open up the airways, as can nasal drops, such as sodium chloride 0.9% nasal drops. C is also for conjunctivitis, so we, if a person comes in and they have maybe greeny, yellowy, stickiness in the eye, and they're finding it really hard to open their eyes, and it's all gunky, and the, the typical symptoms of conjunctivitis, and they're over two years old, we can recommend chloramphenicol, either as eye drops or as eye ointment. If they're using the eye ointment, then they need to pull down the lid and put the ointment in a nice thin layer on the eye, and they can use it three or four times a day. If it's the eye drops that we're giving, then the eye drops first and foremost need to be kept in the fridge. You need to put the eye drops every two hours for the first two days, and then you can, they can be used um, four times a day thereafter. They shouldn't be used for more than five days because by about five days, the conjunctivitis should have been gone. If it hasn't gone, then they would need to be referred. C is also for constipation. Now, if it's a baby that's constipated, then babies can benefit from juices containing sorbitol. For example, prune juice, pear juice. In adults, it's really dependent on the adult. Some adults will find that they're constipated and they need something that's going to work now, like right now, they, they don't want to wait, in which case you'd give something more fast acting, such as Senna or Bicycodile, which they'll take at night time so that they wake up in the morning, they're ready to go. Problems with them though, they can cause a bit of stomach pain. You might get some patients who don't mind waiting for a few days, in which case you can give something that's a, that takes a, a little bit longer to work in the system, such as lactulose or fibre gel. If you do recommend fibre gel, then key counselling point, patient stays hydrated. They need to drink lots more water if they are going to take fibre gel. Now we move on to D, and D is for drowsiness. So I do get a number of patients saying to me that they're feeling very drowsy, feeling very tired, and they think it might be down to their iron level, which, I mean, it could be. Um, personally, though, I always think if it is down to their iron levels, it's actually best if they get a blood test done first, check what their iron levels are like, and then take the necessary supplements if needed. I, I don't really see the reasoning behind just taking iron tablets or taking iron supplements without checking your levels first. So that's, that's something that I would personally always recommend first. D is also for diarrhea. So, for example, um, I mean, we've, we've all had diarrhea, I'm sure, at some point in life. And with diarrhea, if it is acute diarrhea, it's just good to get it all out the system. Um, but make sure the patient is staying hydrated. So something like the Diarolite sachets, rehydration salts, so that they are keeping hydrated there. They are getting a bit more intake of salt and sugar because it will all be going out of them from the other end. They can should be eating dry toast, um, plain biscuits, small but frequent meals um, to again keep that energy up. And if they that is if they can stomach food, um, they might benefit from something like loperamide, especially in patient patients patients especially in patients who just want something that's going to work now and they don't want to wait around. Then yeah, loperamide would be the best bet. In what situations do we need to refer though? Well, if they've had diarrhea for more than four weeks, if they've had any blood in their stools, if they've had a low urine output, um, also if they're associated with any fever, weight loss, or they've been on holiday. D is also for diarrhea. I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced diarrhea at some point in life, but it's really important that if a patient has diarrhea, they keep hydrated. So rehydration salts, diarrhea sachets, they should be taking them because they'll be losing a lot of sugar and salts through their diarrhea. Now, if it's acute diarrhea, let it all out the system. Just, just let it do its thing and let it all out. But you will have patients who just want something that's gonna work here and now and they don't want to wait about, in which case we could recommend loperamide. Now in which situations would we need to refer patients? Well, if they've had diarrhoea for more than four weeks, 
if there's been blood in their stools, if they have a low urine output, if it's been associated with any fever, and if they've been on holiday recently, and any unintentional weight loss. E is for eczema. So in the case of eczema, can be very itchy for patients. So I'd always recommend a cream that contains urea. So something like E45 itch relief cream, or even cro crotamatin, um, something that contains crotamatin, because both of them are very effective in reducing that itchiness. Now, if they're over 10 years old, and the skin isn't broken or infected or cracked, then you could recommend um, hydrocortisone cream, so a steroid-based cream. They might need to be referred onto their GP if it's really severe eczema, because then they would need a stronger steroid-based cream. Also, if they use soap substitutes, so for example, dermal lotion or aqueous cream, something mild on the skin that, that isn't gonna cause even more irritation um, and make it worse, basically. And E is for ears. So if a person has blocked ears because um, of a buildup of earwax, then they might need to be given either olive oil eardrops or sodium bicarbonate eardrops to help loosen that wax and then later go to their GP to get the earwax syringed out. A patient might present with otitis media. So with otitis media, you can cleanse the ear and cleanse the area, but it's probably best to be referred so that um, the doctor can give them a corticosteroid based eardrops. A uh, patient might present with otitis externa, so this is inflammation of the ear canal, could be due to swimming, heat, even eczema. Again, they might need to be referred so that they could be given an anti-infective eardrops, or if it's mild otitis externa, then we could give a product that contains acetic acid, such as ear calm. F is for fungal infections. So many forms of fungal infections, spoken about them in my previous videos, but in summary, if, for example, a person has a brown inhaler, a corticosteroid based inhaler, they're more prone to getting oral fungal infections, so oral candidiasis. If they do get it, then OTC product that we can give is Dactarin gel. They need to put it on in the areas affected and try and retain it in the mouth for as long as possible. They might need to be referred on to their GP, though, if there's a lot of it and or if the dactarin gel isn't sufficient. Um, you can also get thrush, so vaginal candidiasis. In the case of thrush, um, there's the cream that's available for the external itching, so that's the clotrimazole 2%, and you can also get the clotrimazole pessary or the fluconazole capsule. Now, remember, we are pharmacy professionals, we are professionals, and it's always good to counsel patients on how to use these products. So for the pessary, um, you can always refer them to the patient information leaflet, um, but just to briefly explain how it works, you have what I'm going to call a syringe, because I don't know what else to call it. You have a syringe and you've got the actual pessary. Put the pessary in the syringe, insert the whole unit inside high up into the vagina, as high as it will go, press down onto the syringe so that the pessary, the tablet, stays in place, then remove the syringe and discard it. And that should ideally be done at night time. In terms of the cream, I think they can use about twice a day, so just as and when they need it. If they opt for the fluconazole tablet instead, or capsule even instead, then they need to take that. Again, it's a one-off dose. And if they do take other forms of oral contraception, the fluconazole tablet does interact with that. So they might need to use other forms of contraception for the next few days after taking the capsule. Now remember that these thrush treatments, the vaginal thrush treatments, are only for over 16 year olds. So if they're under 16, they need to be referred. And if the patient has had thrush more than twice in the last six months, that third time that they come to you, they will need to be referred just so that the doctor can check and do tests on them to see if there are no other underlying causes or conditions of why they keep getting recurring thrush. For example, diabetes. In terms of fungal infections on the feet, such as athlete's foot, we could give something like tibinafine. Remember though, if more than three toes are affected, or if the patient is diabetic, then we can't give them over-the-counter preparations, they would need to be referred. Another fungal infection is ringworm. Ringworm, you'll be able to tell straight away it's ringworm, because it's a big red circle and a yellowy middle, and for that we could recommend something like Dactarin cream. And if a person has fungal scalp infections, then shampoos that contain ketoconazole or selenium sulfide will provide benefit. G is for gastroenteritis. So in other words, food poisoning, vomiting, diarrhea, what you would give to settle those symptoms. 
And G is also for gourd. So if a person has gourd, we can give them some non-pharmacological advice, such as eat smaller but more frequent meals. They might provide they might gain some benefit if they raise their head off their pillow when they're sleeping. And also um, if they're maybe a bit overweight to try and lose some weight. We could give them or recommend to them Peptac um, or alginates, in other words, so such as Peptac or Gaviscon. Remember, these contain a high salt content, though. So if a person is on blood pressure medication, be a bit weary of that. We could also recommend proton pump inhibitors, such as Ezomeprazole, which you can get as the brand Nexium over the counter, or um, H2 receptor antagonists, such as ranitidine. H is for headaches, so it's important to determine what kind of headache it is. If it's a general headache or a person's a bit stressed out, a bit tense, then we can give something like paracetamol. Now, you might find a patient, they'll be like, oh, I have a really bad headache, I took paracetamol, but it's still really painful. And then you ask them, okay, how many times and how often have you taken paracetamol? Oh, I just took the one tablet once this morning, but I've still got my headache. Yeah, you still will have your headache. You need to be taking it at least two, four times a day, and then that will help with the headache. So before actually recommending any more products, check exactly how they're taking it and how frequently they're taking it, because that will say a lot. If it's a migraine, though, so we could recommend something like somatriptan, but only if they meet the necessary criteria. So, for example, if they're 18 to 65 years old, they've had more than five attacks. Um, but if they're over 50 years old and this is their first occurrence of a migraine, then they would need to be referred. And H is also for head lice. So, best first thing for head lice treatment, wet combing. Shampoo the hair, put loads of conditioner in it, get a fine tooth comb and keep brushing. Keep, keep brushing. And you should find that there are little nits and little lice that fall onto the comb. There are other products available, such as Dimeticone 4% lotion, which comes as um, Lyclear and as Hedrin. These ones can be left on for eight hours or overnight. Usually apply it twice, seven days apart. Good thing about them, they can be used in over six months old, so children over six months old, and they can be used in asthmatics. You also have isopropyl nitrate and cyclomethicone. I don't know how many times I practiced saying that, but the brand name that, that comes is Full Mark Solution. Um, with this one, you can apply it to dry hair for 15 minutes. Again, you apply it twice, seven days apart. I is for insect bites. So if you get bitten by an insect, first and foremost, take an antihistamine. Um, you might, person might find benefit by having some hydrocortisone cream. Remember, you can only give hydrocortisone in certain conditions, for example, if they're over 10 years old and it's not on broken or infected skin, or cracked skin, and it's not on the face or the anogenital regions. Um, person might also benefit from calamine lotion or a cream containing crotamatin. I is also for impetigo. Impetigo you might um, see predominantly in little bebes, so they might get these little yellow crustings around the nose and the mouth. With Impetigo, it's quite self-limiting. I mean, it should go in about two to three weeks, but you might want to refer the patient onwards um, so that the doctor can give them an antibiotic cream. It, also, the good thing about referring them is that once they then start the treatment, it reduces the risk of the infection being spread to other people. J is for jet lag, and actually I'm going to creep I for insomnia into this as well, so jet lag and insomnia. So you might be able to identify that someone isn't getting a good night's sleep if they keep purchasing products that contain diphenylhydramine or they want to take products that have a, sed a sedative effect such as antihistamines. Now for these should be used for more than seven days and you would need to refer the patient if they're particularly elderly, if they're under 16, if they're pregnant or breastfeeding or if they're having to use these for more than seven days, which shouldn't be, shouldn't, shouldn't be given for more than seven days. So, but in these situations, you need to refer them. Now, you, we can provide lots of advice for these patients and we can signpost them. So it'd be a good idea to signpost them to the NHS website, which has a whole section on sleep hygiene and some really good tips and advice on how, how to get a better night's sleep. So, for example, by avoiding alcohol or caffeine or big heavy meals just before bed, regular exercise but not not um, four hours just before going to bed 
that can all help, as well as setting up a routine. So waking up at the same time every day, going to bed at the same time every day, that can all help. That can also help with jet lag as well, as well as avoiding naps, which is hard because, I mean, nap time's the best, but yeah, gonna have to try and avoid that. A is for kidney stones. Now, if a person did present with kidney stones, they would ha have to be referred, but the advice that we can give is that they stay hydrated. So lots and lots and lots of water. L is for labyrinthitis. Goodness knows if I'm saying that right, but let's just go with it. So labyrinthitis, some of the symptoms that could develop with it are, for example, nausea, double vision, vertigo, tinnitus, headaches. And the advice that we could provide is that the patient stays hydrated, avoids alcohol, avoids bright lights. We could give them an antiemetic such as prochlorperazine, three milligrams, which they can get over the counter. But if it's really severe, they might need to be referred, in which case the doctor can give them benzodiazepines, corticosteroids or even antibiotics. L is also for lower back pain. So if a patient presents with lower back pain, first and foremost, painkillers. What advice can we give? Well, um, exercise can, get, can help, such as muscle strengthening exercises. If they're particularly overweight, then reducing some of that weight can help, as can um, making sure that a patient is wearing sensible shoes, that they're sitting properly, particularly if they have an office-based job or they're driving very frequently, that they are sitting properly um, and that they lift things. If, they, if they're lifting or carrying things, then they lift them in the, in the most proper way. So bending with your knees and not with your back, basically. M is for menstruation or menstrual pain. So if a person has pain, then paracetamol. If they have really bad dysmenorrhea, then we can give them ibuprofen or even methanamic acid. If we do give methanamic acid, then it shouldn't really be used for more than seven days. If they have really bad menorrhagia, so really heavy bleeding, they might benefit from tranexamic acid. But remember, tranexamic acid can only be used in certain conditions. So, well, if, if the patient meets certain criteria. So if they're over 18 years old and they have a regular 21 to 35 day cycle with no more than three days variability. And it should ideally not be used for more than five days. M is also for the morning after pill. So I've spoken about this in great depth in my previous videos. But just to summarise, there's two main morning after pills, levonorgestrel and eulipristal acetate, both of which can be taken within 72 hours of um, sexual intercourse, but eulipristal acetate can also be used if it's within 120 hours of sexual intercourse. Now, it can only be given for an over 16 year old, and remember to double check if the patient's on any other regular medication. If they take, for example, enzyme inducing medication, such as carbamazepine, phenobarbital, St. John's wort, um, then they would need to be referred. If the patient has Crohn's disease, again, they would need to be referred. Um, we wouldn't be able to give it to them. M is also for morning sickness, very commonly presented in a community pharmacy setting. So very important for us to be able to give the most appropriate advice. So lots of fluid. It's very important that patients still tries to eat something so they have small but frequent meals, even something like dry toast or biscuits. Ginger biscuits in particular is meant to be very beneficial. Ginger in general, so even like ginger tea is meant to really help. If it is very severe, then they might need to get an antiemetic from the GP. And they should also be referred if there's any blood that's coming up in their vomit. If they've been vomiting for more than 24 hours, they have a fever or any abdominal pain or any dark urine. M is for nappy rash. So with nappy rash, we want to try and prevent it. How can we do so? Well, change nappy as soon as possible. Um, also wipe from front to back. Bathe the baby daily. And when you do bathe them, make sure when the patient bathes the baby, make sure it's not in really harsh um, soaps, or bubble baths, lotions. And once the baby is bathed and they've dried with a towel and whatnot, lay the baby down for a while and try and keep the nappy off for as long as possible, just to let the fresh air go to the area and stuff. And they might benefit from a barrier cream, for example, Sudocrem. N is also for nosebleeds. So if somebody presents with a nosebleed, it's important that they pinch this part of their nose and they lean forward so that all that blood can just drain out. Um, in situations you would need to refer them, if they are under two years old, they're getting frequent unexplained nosebleeds, they're short of breath, or if they're on an anticoagulant such as warfarin. O is for obesity, and with obesity, if the patient meets the right criteria, we could give them Orlistat. Orlistat needs to be taken one, three times a day. 
but it's very important that we do give um, fat soluble vitamins to the patient um, because they'll be losing a lot of it if they are when they're taking the Orlistat. What are our, our, our fat soluble vitamins? Well it's DEAK, D-E-A-K, those are fat soluble vitamins so make sure that they are taking a multivitamin if they are taking Orlistat as well. P is for pain, pain go through your nice guidelines Paracetamol first, if that's not working, then an NSAID like ibuprofen, if that's not working, then codeine, if that's not working, refer. P is also for psoriasis, so in the case of psoriasis, you want to put an emollient to protect the area, reduce any itching and scaling, and they might need to be referred onwards so that the doctor can give them a steroid-based cream. Q is for quitting smoking. So if a patient once waking up needs a cigarette within the first five minutes of waking up, then they might benefit from a 24 hour patch. Otherwise, they might benefit from a 16 hour patch. Along with the patch, you should recommend either the little minis, the little mints, the lozenges, inhalators, whatever works best for the patient and always tailor nicotine replacement therapy for that patient. Now, a way that I was taught, um, which was, I think, is a very good and effective way of bringing up quitting smoking in a community setting is, for example, when a patient presents with a dry cough and they want you to recommend a product for them. After giving them the necessary counselling points and whatnot, you can then ask them, does anyone in your household smoke? Now, this is a better question than directly asking someone, do you smoke? Because when you ask someone that, a lot of the time they become a lot more defensive. Whereas if you ask, does anybody in your household smoke? It's a more open question and then be more willing to actually admit, well, actually, yeah, I smoke. And then you can start off that conversation to see how motivated they are to quit or even if it's on their radar to quit smoking. And at least this gives you a chance also to use your motivational interviewing techniques. R is for Ray syndrome. Now, Ray syndrome isn't that commonly presented, but it, we still need to know the signs and symptoms of it. Just in case if, for example, an under 16 year old took aspirin, not realising that they're not supposed to be taking aspirin because they're under 16, it's important that we know the signs and symptoms of it. So, for example, vomiting, tiredness, rapid breathing, even seizures. And in all these cases, refer them straight away. S is for sexual health and STIs. Now, a lot can be said for a person's discharge. So if they're getting white cottage cheese-like discharge, then chances are a thrush. If they're getting a yellowy, greeny, foul-smelling discharge, chances are it's an STI. If they do present with an STI or they explain the signs and symptoms of an STI, unless your pharmacy has a PGD for azithromycin, they would need to be referred. The S is also for shingles. So usually with sing shingles, shingles, with shingles, it's on one side of the body and it presents as a painful rash, can also get a fever and it's like a burning, scalding sensation. That's usually how patients will describe the feeling as. Now, the way to treat it would be with um, antipyretics, so paracetamol, painkillers. They might need to be um, referred to the GP for antivirals in some cases. S is also for sinusitis. So sinusitis is inflammation of the sinuses. So the way that usually patients present with it is that they've got a blocked nose or greeny yellow discharge coming from the nose, bad headache, and their cheeks and their forehead feel quite tender. And, these, and they might even have a fever. In these situations, we could give paracetamol, ibuprofen, could even recommend pseudoephedrine, but remember it comes with a lot of legalities. So make sure the person does fit the criteria for pseudoephedrine. They might also benefit from a nasal decongestant, but these shouldn't be used for more than seven days. And even um, saline nasal sprays can also help. Situations where the patient would need to be referred is, for example, the symptoms getting worse. They've had it for more than seven to 10 days or they're getting frequent episodes of sinusitis. S is also for sprains and strains. So in the case of sprains and strains, first and foremost, price. Protect, rest, ice, elevate. And for the first 72 hours, a patient should avoid harm, heat, alcohol, running and massage, because this can actually increase inflammation and swelling. Also within the first 48 hours, a patient shouldn't take ibuprofen because this can delay healing. There's ibuprofen tablets, ibuprofen gels and stuff. They're usually fine. T is for threadworms. If a patient presents with threadworms, their whole household needs to be treated and you'd give them libendazole and it can be used in over two-year-olds. It's a one-off dose, but if symptoms persist after two weeks, 
then a second dose needs to be given. Over the counter, um, maximum pack size of 800 milligrams is available. Now, the non-pharmacological advice that you give to patients is that they wash all their sleepwear, their bed linen, their towels to wipe down and hoover any bathroom surfaces, their bedroom, their mattresses, and that when they first wake up, they immediately take a shower, focusing on the anus region so that any eggs that were laid overnight, they can just go away. C is also for travel sickness. So in the case of travel sickness, you want to try and reduce motion as much as you can. So for example, if you're in a car, sit in the front of the car. If you're on a boat, sit on the middle deck of the boat. Other methods that can help, if, for example, again, if you're in a car, keep the window down so that you get letting fresh air in. Um, also avoid big heavy meals um, before driving off. Try and get some sleep. Don't read or um, watch films because that, can, that doesn't help with the travel sickness and keep hydrated. Now, you can recommend something like hyoscine butyl bromide because it reduces muscle spasms, reduces intestinal mobility, so it might help the patient. Um, but usually in terms of motion sickness, you would recommend hyoscine hydrobromide instead. Remember, hyoscine butyl bromide comes as buscopan because B for buscopan, B for butyl bromide. Hyoscine hydrobromide comes as quells. So why would you give the hydrobromide instead? Well, because the way that the hydrobromide works is that it reduces the release of acetylcholine in the vestibular system. This in turn reduces stimulation of the vomiting center in the brain. So very effective for travel sickness. The patient might also benefit from an antihistamine such as cinarazine, which can be given two hours before traveling. U is for urinary tract infections, such as cystitis, very common. If a patient has had it before, then recommend cranberry juice or um, products that contain cranberry, like cytopurin. Um, in situations that you would need to refer, though, is if this is the first time a patient is experiencing cystitis and they're not exactly sure if it is definitely cystitis that they have. If there's any blood in the urine, they have any severe pain. This is the third time in the year that they've had it, or more than three times in a year that they've had it and if they're pregnant, male or a child. U is also for ulcers, such as mouth ulcers, Bongella. If they're under 16, make sure they only use the child Bongella. They're not allowed to use the adult Bongella. V is for vomiting. We've all vomited, especially after a heavy night out. But in what situations would we need to refer? Well, if the patient's had vomiting for more than 48 hours, if there's blood in their vomit, if they're bringing up green coloured, like a greeny coloured vomit, because this could indicate that they're bringing up bile. If they're bringing up bile, this could possibly mean that there is an obstruction in their bowel. If they have severe stomach pains, because this could indicate appendicitis, or if they have a high temperature with a stiff neck. Also, if the person is feeling quite dizzy and they're passing very little urine, which is signs of dehydration. V is for verrucas and W for warts. In the cases of both, they're quite self-limiting and actually treatment can be very time consuming, can be painful and sometimes it doesn't work. But there are gels and um, plasters, creams, all available for treating warts and verrucas. Majority of them contain salicylic acid. You can also get over-the-counter products which try to freeze the warts, but actually the salicylic acid is, is the most effective one. Now, with a person that has a wart, they need to soak their wart in water for five minutes to help soften it. And it's really important that they surround the, that they protect the surrounding skin using petroleum jelly before using the salicylic acid, because that can be really quite burning. And actually, only last week, I had a patient come to me who had a couple of warts on his hand and he wasn't using petroleum jelly to protect the surrounding skin. And he'd been using the salicylic acid for quite a number of weeks, months even, and his hand was peeling off, like it was burnt because of the salicylic acid. So it's so important that your patients do put the petroleum jelly to protect the surrounding area. Once a week, it'll be worth them using a pumice stone to just um, file down the wart as well. Now you would refer the patient if the wart is on their face, if they're getting frequent warts, or if the over-the-counter preparations just aren't helping them. Ways to prevent the warts is avoid touching other people's warts and avoid touching your own wart because then you might transfer it onto another area. Try and keep hands and feet clean and dry. 
If you've got warts and wrinkles on the feet, then don't go barefoot. And try to avoid picking or scratching at them too. X is for extra information. So as well as using your WAMO questions, so just to remind us, WAMO stands for first W, so who's the product for, what are the symptoms, any action taken, on any other medication, and other, so our other, so is a person pregnant, are they breastfeeding, do they have any underlying conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, do they take any herbal products such as St John's wort, do they take any other homeopathic remedies or um, any other form of alternative therapies. It's really important that we get the whole picture of a patient before we recommend a product to them so that we, we make sure that they, we do give them the most suitable product that will help alleviate their symptoms. And why is for, yes, you can remember all of these. If you're in a community setting, then you have the upper hand in terms of responding to symptoms because it means that you can go on the healthcare counter, you can interact with patients and you can try and use this knowledge in, in an actual real life setting. And those of you that aren't in um, a community setting, check out the RPS website for um, over-the-counter information, NHS website as well, and hopefully this video will help too. And Z is for, in other words, take a break because this was a long video and you deserve it. So I hope this video kind of clears up some of those over-the-counter situations that you might find in um, a community setting or you might find patients coming up to you about and asking questions on. Remember there are other, there are so many other potential over-the-counter queries that you could um, be presented with but hopefully this is a snapshot of some of the key and some of the main ones um, that you may experience. And if you found this video useful, why not give us a like, give us a thumbs up, share, subscribe, visit our Facebook page, visit our Twitter page, and good luck with your revision. Happy revisings.